say hello. Sweet, thank you. Great to see you. Yeah, of course. Good yeah. Now, I was so excited about this talk that I sent out. Are those all your portfolio companies over there? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, yeah, what? Yeah. I, I sent out a tweet telling people they've got to come in and listen to this talk. The first retweet is your mom. Oh, she's man. there in, in Berkeley. Weird bit she's on the West Coast. So yeah, a... she's stayed up late to, uh, to watch you live. I've sent her the live stream URL. I think URL. she has a bot set up anytime I mention she retweets. Is that what it is? I think so. Yeah, yeah. she's a smart, <laughs> a smart wound. Yeah. Stage is yours. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. So, um, two things about South Asians overbearing mothers and 15 minutes late to everything. Uh, another thing about venture investors, they're also 15 minutes late to anything. So, me being a venture investor and South Asian, I made these slides at 5 a.m. today, so bear with me. It's the first time we're going through them. Um, I teach a course at Stanford, and this really is a, uh, a synopsis of 10 weeks of what Stanford students get. Uh, so if you have any questions or if any of this is too fast or too much, um, uh, Azim was uh, gracious enough to welcome me and um, actually invite me to guest author an Exponential View post a few months back. This is essentially a, a decked out version or, or a slide version of that talk. So you can always go to Azim's Exponential View, sign up for it, um, and then also dig in there. I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about new radical empiricism, and, and I'll define it in a bit. I want to start with a little bit of a motivating thought experiment. Let's think about Johannes or Johannes. I'm, I'm American, so I'm going to say Johannes. The, the Europeans might kill me afterwards. Uh, if Kepler were a young scientist in today's world, uh, and he were bent on understanding uh, you know, the, the rules that governed planetary movement, what would he do? Right? Would he look like the figure on the left, the actual Kepler? Or we, would he look something more like you know, uh, a programmer uh, or someone we imagine as a computer scientist today? In the base case, right, the base case is where he stays consistent with his representation from the 17th century. Uh, is that he thinks really long and hard. He stares at the sky every night, he posits some mathematical equations or some physics equations, and says, I think this is how these kind of satellites in the sky are moving. And maybe every other night he checks his equations against the results, and he iterates and he iterates and he iterates. But at the end of the day, he, he finds some equations and he thinks that those equations, in some sense, are the ground truth, right? They are what govern planetary movement. To do this kind of work, and really to do any work, I think, with, with the scientific method, uh, we need to have three assumptions, and I'm going to walk us through those three assumptions. One, I'm going to pause right now because I, I don't know if anyone really expected to start talking about metaphysics or physics or philosophy or any of this stuff at COGX, so if you want to walk out, now is your chance. Um, one, we need to assume a metaphysical ground truth, right? We assume that there are rules and our jobs are to be detectives. Right? We're out there to unearth them. But certainly these rules exist whether or not we ever, ever learn them. Right? Before we knew the law, before we knew exactly that you know, gravity was 9.81 meters per second squared, it still was 9.81 meters per second squared. Right? Fail case. How can this fail? We may have an intuition that there is a set of rules, but why always trust our intuition? Right? What's an example of that? An example is primes. Most mathematicians, most young mathematicians, are actually surprised when they learn that there's no pattern that governs primes. Let's well, screen turn off. There we go. Um, primes are a particularly inter interesting example because we can always find and model the nth prime, but we don't have a closed form formula uh, to, to, to solve for it. Right? So detective work here might yield interesting adjacent uh, uh, results, which of course, of course a lot of the field of number theory has. Uh, but it would be a fruitless endeavor to actually go find a, a closed form formula for primes. Two, what's another kind of uh, assumption that a young Kepler would make when he's out there trying to figure out the rules that, again, govern planetary movement? Language, abstraction, and specificity, right? Our language and abstractions sit at the correct layer of specificity to reduce the rules to a finite set of statements, right? How can this fail? Fail case, again, just walking through science from the 20th century. We're, imagine we're attempting to define genetic diseases before 1953, before Watson and Crick discover DNA, right? We may understand the symptom, the disease, but we'll have no way to actually reduce it to its basic components. And even here, actually, with Kepler, we realize that Kepler was privy to exactly this failure case, right? 
It turns out to actually understand the, the, the laws of planetary movement, you need to have general relativity. Of course, that machinery, that language, that level of abstraction didn't exist in Kepler's time. So he was set to fail. And I termed this grok ability. This is assumption number three. These rules might exist, and let's, let's, let's say they do. Let's say they're a metaphysical thing. But are they necessarily within a reasonable realm of complexity, graspable by, graspable by a human brain? even Azeem's brain. Right. And again, fail cases, tons. Chaos theory, AlphaGo, the four color problem. Right? That was a proof that was done by, by a computer. For a long time in, in, in mathematical communities, it was unclear whether or not that was considered a proof. And again, in fact, going back to, uh, going back to AlphaGo, uh, we have an example where it feels like it might actually be the case that computers have surpassed, right, uh, or proven that there are truths, there are patterns in the game of AlphaGo that maybe no human brain will, will ever be able to learn. It might just be too complex for what's in here. I'll summarize. In employing the scientific method, a young Kepler assumed metaphysical existence, right, he was a detective, Truth existed and it was accessible, accessible given the toolkits that he had and three grok ability that humans could actually understand or fathom or, or, or put them into their brains. Right? In, in, if you were a philosopher, you would call him a realist and a reductionist. Right? There are things that they are real and you can reduce them into basic primitive components. What's interesting and where this kind of starts to tie in to AI and machine learning is that most scientists, physicists, and mathematicians all come from exactly this philosophical school of thought, right? And those early mathematicians and philosophers then became the early practitioners of AI. Tacitly, going back to Kepler, he actually carried this philosophy into other disciplines. Here's his work in chemistry. He tried to reduce earth, wind, wire, water, fire, and air to the platonic solids, right? This was his reductionism showing through. And here we laugh at him, right? Here he seems crazy. Right? But when, when he gets the philosophy right in another domain, he seems really smart. So what's this got to do with AI? I hinted at it a few seconds back. Right? The early AI practitioners were exactly mathematicians and philosophers and physicists. They were moving into AI to understand AI and they viewed it as a reductive practice. Right? They saw it as their jobs to unearth what intelligence was. Definitionally, intelligence existed, whether or not humans were there to instantiate it. They assumed that intelligence could be reduced to a finite set of rules from the syntax and semantics of code. Right? I'm going to open up. And three, they assumed that it was within their grasp. Right? Give enough programmers and researchers enough time with enough servers and enough computers and they'll explicate the exact rules of intelligence. I'm going to say that modern machine learning has really made those last three assumptions irrelevant. Right? Just as today we scoff at Kepler's realism applied to chemistry, if that's what you want to call it, we're not far from the exact same visceral reaction of scoffing when we consider the earliest instantiations of AI. And the images here I have of, are of early kind of edge drawing uh, or edge tracing uh, computer vision tasks, right? That today anyone who's practicing deep learning or has experimented with a CNN might scoff at. The hints are everywhere. There's a famous computer scientist, Peter Norvig, who's the director of research at Google. There's another famous polymath Noam Chomsky, who was the most cited, I think, intellect in the 20th century. And Norvig calls Chomsky a mystic. Right? He says that that assumption of metaphysical ground truth is an unbased, invalid assumption. And because of that, you're essentially a mystic. Right? So the, the later stages of practitioners today are looking back at the earlier generations and calling it out. This is where we get into new radical empiricism. So in essence, the creation of digitized data, the availability of compute, and the maturation of distributed computing paradigms hasn't only ushered in machine learning, but it's enabled us to shift philosophically how we view the science itself, right? We no longer assume that there's a ground truth. We employ prior data to predict and mo model forward. 
right? Ground truth doesn't matter, right? Predictability matters. We're no longer limited by, by the language or the machinery, the mechanics, the abstractions that we have. Rather, it's the data, the fidelity, the size, right? And grokability is irrelevant, depending on who you're talking to. Right? There are issues around, hey, these models are so complex, we don't really understand them. But that, that issue is a human anthropological issue. It's not an issue with the science. The science works. The computer science works. So the new radical empiricism, right? The underpinnings of AI haven't only pushed the advancements in computational methods, right? The philosophical evolution is what's actually pushing the, the advancements in AI. Look at data, model data, rinse and repeat. Try to assume nothing. I'd argue that new radical empiricism or radical empiricism isn't only affecting computer science and machine learning. It's eating every domain and discipline. So going back to our thought example, if there were a young Kepler alive today, would he think really long and hard? Or would he point a camera to the sky and train an RNN? Turns out that DeepMind did exactly that in 2016. Perhaps proving that Kepler would look more like this and less like that. I'm sure his style's changed too, so. NRE shows efficacy in results, right? So moving away from something maybe that's a little bit more simple planetary movement, chaos theory, right? That's a field that reductive physicists have struggled for decades. Right? It's exceptionally complex. We have few closed form formulas, and most of them don't work. They taper out in their, in their efficiency or their ability to actually predict and model forward. The University of Maryland had a recent paper that used deep learning nets to model forward or play forward results from chaos theory. And they showed that their results were eight times better than the best closed form formulas we had. Right? There was some good press about it. Moving to macroeconomics. I got a B minus in college econ, so I've always had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about this. Decades of failure from macroeconomist e practice show one, there is no static underlying structure, and two, its complexity likely rivals that of chaos, likely beyond the reach of mechanistic human grasp. Yet it continues to be practiced like a, re like a reductive science. Right? We have academics in the halls of the best universities around the world positing and waxing philosophy via closed form even though we know via empirical results from really the last two centuries that it does very little in terms of actually having the ability to predict forward. Until recently, there's, an, there's actually a, a really promising economist out of, the, out of MIT. Uh, I suspect he's on the path to a Nobel laureate in the next two decades, Andrew Lowe. He coins that economists have physics envy. Right? Maybe in physics you're allowed to get away with a metaphysical assumption of ground truth, but perhaps in econ you shouldn't, right? And maybe economists are guilty of that physics envy. It's culminated in recent pop fiction, critiquing the role of reductionism in economics and pushing for NRE. They may not call, call it NRE, and candidly, I don't know if anyone else in the world really, other than me and a few of the founders I've backed, call it NRE. But it's, it's a lens to view what other people are talking about, right? And if you view it as NRE, you start to see it pop up across every discipline. Not just in AI and physics and econ economics, but maybe even anthropology. The list goes on. Thesis, NRE eats the world. A play on Mark Andreessen, software eats the world, if anyone is familiar with that. How do you practice this? What is the thesis? Find any field with the following characteristics. One, they need to have data. And two, it still needs to be practiced as a reductive science. If it is a reductive science and they've really nailed it, it doesn't matter. Move on from the data. But if, if they practice it as a reductive science and it doesn't work, then that's where you should go. I'm looking at you, economists. Introduce NRE. Baseball and basketball, right? Who's seen Moneyball? A few people, right? That's a great example of a field or a, or a domain that was practiced as a reductive science. How thick is the athlete's neck, right? How confident is, is he when he shakes your hand? Those were high-level proxies for an ability to gauge athletic performance. A good friend of mine, actually in, in, in the NBA, did, did a study assessing, hey, are there actually five types of players or maybe more? 
right? Historically, again, we've, we've assumed just because there are five players for any team on the court at any time, there must be five types of players. It turns out there are more, right? And that's just by introducing data and just doing fairly basic clustering. And I think the NBA right now is, is starting to have a little bit of the same notoriety with respect to data that baseball did maybe in the 90s and early 2000s. Biology and drug discovery. You guys are going to have a bunch of really smart people talk about this in about 20 minutes, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But decades of failure from reductive science, fail failures in abstraction, and nonlinear complexity, likely beyond the grasp of human kind of understanding or ability to understand, yields E. Room's law. This is literally Moore's law backwards. Right over here, you see on a log scale the exponentially increasing cost to bring a drug to market. Right? Reductive biology simply doesn't work. It's so bad, in fact, that most analysts right now look at the entire industry and say the business model is going to break within the next two decades. Right? The way things are today won't last going into the future. So here, too, NRE is showing some early traction and turning heads. I think Shiva is in the room here. This is actually a, a screenshot of her homepage from Zymergen. Right? Automating wet lab protocols to capture and make re reproducible high fidelity data. That's step one. Right? Moving away from reductionism, moving away from having to have scientists have eureka moments in front of chalkboards, but rather have scientists do the blocking and tackling of capturing data and then applying the right machine learning modalities or methodologies or algor algorithms to the data. Right? There are impressive results. Right. Here's actually a, a paper from Janssen in, I think it's Germany or Switzerland. Uh, but this paper captured a lot of zeitgeist. Right. And it showed the effect, it showed the ability to use machine learning and computer vision on cell morphology, on the images and shapes of cells to, to predict chemical assays. Right. Not at all looking at the structure of the chemical, not at all looking at the, the, the types of proteins in the cell, Right? but rather really just looking at what we have, which is empirical visual data of a cell. It's, again, grabbing attention from industry leaders. And this last slide, I'm pretty pumped. I'm not going to steal Chris's thunder too much, but it actually manifests into a clinical pipeline. Right? And these are the sorts of clinical pipelines that no other startups have ever been able to develop and show off in this amount of time with this little money. Right? NRE in biology and NRE in all of these fields is incredibly efficacious. It's powerful. There are questions we need to think about and we need to ask. Where do we go from here in open questions? One, if you're an entrepreneur or an, or an investor, I've certainly used this thesis the last six years. Build, invest, create, and disrupt with the lens of NRE across myriad industries and domains. Two, there is absolutely space for reductionism. There are fields where there are ground truths, right? There's dissonance, though, because it does feel like machine learning and the availability of, the, of, of data makes NRE a more efficacious path, at least from a, a predictability standpoint, right? So we need to figure out how we save space for pure research to actually go in and, 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 and uncover truths. Three, empiricism and NRE are based on data. If the data is biased, what do we do? Again, I'm sure we had lots of folks probably on the ethics panel talking about exactly this. But I'll leave it there. And um, I believe I'm actually on a panel next. So I'll, I'll sit here. Thank you, Calvin. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Great.